Good morning. I just like to uh, greet you in my language so you can hear the sound of it. Why has Khalkhalt Yayati Pis Naksil Khalak and Limp Kinskits Khala? I said uh, it's a really great morning to be here and I'm a little bit nervous. And, but I'm really enjoying uh, being here and I wanted first of all to uh, thank the organizers and uh, the sponsors and everybody who's uh, worked together to put this wonderful, wonderful forum together, this wonderful conference. I grew up in a really remote part of um, the Okanagan on the Penticton Indian Reservation and I was born on the reservation at home. And I grew up in a family that uh, practiced uh, hunting, gathering tradition on the land. And I am still immersed in that family. And growing up in a community that, uh, that was uh, also fractionalized uh, by colonization, fractionalized in many ways um, in terms of uh, the, the, the community itself, gave me some insights and observations that I think uh, could be valuable. Um, one of the observations that I have uh, is this regard to human relationship and um, the relationship that we have with each other and how that relationship we have with each other impacts um, what we do to the land. In other words, what we do to each other and how we look at each other, how we interact with each other is a um, is one of the reasons some things are happening to the land. I grew up uh, in a community in the extended family in which our people organized themselves in a very different way, I think, than I see happening outside of that. The land that I come from is uh, something very similar to California here. It's very uh, um, dry and semi-arid. It's considered, I think, the northern tip of the Sonoran Desert. And so the ecosystem there is very, very fragile. At this time uh, in the Okanagan, um, it's one of the most damaged um, areas and ecosystems in Canada because of its fragility. There are many conservationists and environmentalists really concerned about uh, the species that are disappearing, the endangered species in the Okanagan. And that's been difficult um, because we grew up loving the land. We grew up loving each other on the land and loving each plant and each species the way we love our brothers and sisters. And that's the point that I wanted to uh, talk mostly about. That doesn't just happen as an intellectual process. That doesn't just happen as a process of needing to gather food and needing to sustain your bodies um, for its health. That happens as a result of how we interact with each other um, in, our, in our families, in our family units and in our extended family units and in our communities the networks that we make outward from that to other people who surround us on the land, that those networks are extremely important parts of, of what happens to the land and how we interact with the land. And so my thinking is, um, in, in terms of the work that I have to do, is I have to try to find a way to interpret some of that and interpret some of that to bring reconciliation to members of my community on my land in order to bring health back to the land. That I cannot do that responsibly if I cannot create that kind of understanding. In the Okanagan, our understanding of the land is that it's not just that we're part of the land. It's not just that we're part of the vast system that operates on the land, but that the land is us that in, in our language um, the word for our for our bodies contains the word for land so when I say means that not only is my ability to think and, and to dream present always in that word but the last part of the word means the land 
so that in my mind, every time I say that word and I refer to myself as Skailu, I realize that I'm from the land. I, I'm saying that I'm from the land and that my body is the land. When I go out to the land to gather the foods that have given me life and given my grandmother's life and my great-great-grandmother's life for many, many generations, that our people have perfected a way of interacting with each other when they go out to the land that is respectful to the land and respectful to each other, but also fulfills some needs that we have that are human in terms of interaction and, and, and relationship to each other. What our, what our grandparents have said is that the land feeds you, but we feed the land as well. And what she meant by that uh, was, was saying to us that in our language, we give our bodies back to the land in a really physical way, but we also do other things to the land. We, we live on the land and we use the land and we can impact the land. We can destroy the land or we can love the land and it can love us back. One of the things I started to observe and understand was that how we make decisions and how we choose to look at each other as people, as equals, as, as human beings, and how we approach each other is fundamental to how we interact with the land. In the most basic sense, our use of the land relates to our need for food, for shelter, for clothing. And beyond that, um, when we look at society, when we look at how society is constructed, those are the things that, that we need. Those are the things that we need in order to live and breathe every day. But besides that, we need pleasure. We need to be loved. We need to have the, the support of our community and the love and, and the care that our people that surround us give us. If those two ideas and ideals can work together, then we can see how either you can impact the land in a negative way or in a positive way. And I think if you look around at how the land has been impacted by the what I call a Western culture, uh, one of the things that I see is that there's an overuse of the resources and there's an, a lack of access for some of the people. In other words, there are some people with a right to have more and some people with a right with no right. And there are some people that uh, cannot access the things that they need even for their basic lives. And when you look at the idea of democracy, there's something profoundly wrong with the idea of, of um, a hierarchical system in which some people can exist within the idea that it's okay to have people sitting next to you or next door to you and not have the access and not have the ability to the same things that you have. That seems to me a profoundly uh, basic principle in our community that everyone in a community needs to have the same access to the basics and the same access to the enjoyment and pleasure of life. So one of the things that I was looking at was the idea of the construct of how we make decisions. I looked at the Okanagan decision-making process in its traditional sense, and from our point of view, the minority voice is the most important voice to consider in terms of... in terms of the things that are going wrong, the things that we're not looking after, the things that we're not doing, and the things we're not being responsible toward, and the things that we're being aggressive about in terms of trying to overlook and shove them into the corner or sweep them under the carpet or shove them out the door. One of the things our leaders said in the four societies process that we use is that if you do that, one of the things that's going to happen is the conflict that that creates in your community is going to create a breakdown that's going to endanger all of us. 
that's going to endanger how we use, how we cooperate, how we use the community as a process, how we think of ourselves as a cooperative unit, a harmonious unit, a unit that knows how to work together and enjoys working together and enjoys being together and loves one another. If that happens, then the things that we need to do on an everyday basis for, for meeting our, all of our needs start to break apart. And I can see that. I can see how that's working today. And I understand that if we think about um, looking at the minority, if we use the process to think about, well, why is that, why is that there is a minority? Is it about poverty? Is it about economics? Is it, is it about societal access? What are, the, what are those minorities about? And if we think about of ourselves as, a, as a human beings with minds, the creativity that we have should be able to take into consideration how we meet the needs of those minorities, how we, how we find every possible mechanism that we can to uh, bring that minority group um, into balance with the rest of the majority. And so that process that we call an Auk and we asks us to do that and tells us that if we can't do that in our community, that our, our humanity is at stake, that our intelligence is at stake, that we can't call ourselves Okanagan if we can't do that, if we can't provide for the weak and the sick and the hungry and the old and the people who do not have the skills. And in the same way, when we approach the, the decision-making process, one component of it is reserved for the land. We have one component in which we have the people who are called land speakers. We call them Sukhpaqwalula in our language. And I've been fortunate to be trained and brought up as a land speaker in my community. Different than other communities, we have people who are trained as a part of a family system to be a speaker for the children, to be a speaker for the mothers, to be a speaker for the elders, to be a speaker for the medicine people, to be a speaker for the land, to be a speaker for the water, to be a speaker for all of these different components that make up our existence. My, my part has been to, to be trained by some elders to, to think about the land. No matter what the decision is, the smallest decision, and I, I, it's my responsibility to stand up and say, what about, how is it going to impact the land? How is it going to impact our food? How is it going to impact our water? How is it going to impact my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren? What's the land going to look like at that time? And so, in that four societies process, um, what we call an auk and we, there's a built-in principle in terms of how we interact. And another part of the process requires people to look at relationships. There are people who stand up and say, it's my responsibility to see how is this going to, how is this decision going to impact people? How is it going to impact the children? What are the children's needs? What are the elders' needs? What are the mother's needs? What are the working people's needs? And ask those questions. And that's their responsibility. You know, part of our community stands up and, and says, what are the things that need to be built? What are the things that need to be implemented? How much is it going to cost? And all of those things. Those people in that part who are speakers and doers in that part are given the responsibility of continuously reminding our people that there are actions that are going to cause a number of different um, things later on down the road if we overuse this or if we take too much of that. And so those people are continuously asked to stand up to provide that information. There's another group of people that are what we call the visionaries in our community, the creative people, the artists, the writers, the performers, who, uh, whose responsibility is to bring in that perspective into the community that tells everyone that there are innovations, that there are creative approaches, that there are new ways we can look at things, and that we should always make room for newness because 
because we need to be creative whenever we, we come up against something that we can't resolve, that we haven't come up against before. And so those people are always brought forward to look for new ways to discuss and bring forward creative ideas. So all four of those components together then can participate in a decision-making process. When we include that perspective of land, we include the perspective of human relationship, one of the things that happens is that community changes. People in the community change. Something happens inside where the material things don't have a lot of meaning, where material wealth and and securing that and being fearful and being frightened about not having those things uh, to sustain you, they start to lose. They start to lose their power. They start to lose their impact. When you start realizing that it's people and community that are there to sustain you, and that that's the most secure thing in the world. When you feel that and you're immersed in that, and the fear is gone. The fear starts to leave you when that happens and you're, and you're imbued with the hope, with the hope that others that surround you and your community um, can provide that. That's the kind of work that I'm involved in at Anaukan Center. And, and in terms of the work with uh, community, I'm talking about all of the community. I'm talking about all of the people who live in the Okanagan and people that we reach outside of that not just the indigenous people, because at this time in, in, in our lives, what our elders have said is that unless we can Okanaganize those people in their thinking, we're all in danger in the Okanagan. <laughs> For me, it's, uh, it sounds very simple, and it seems to be um, an, an overwhelming task, a huge task, and some days it feels like that. Some days it seems to be something that one person has no power against. But then when I, when I think about, um, in my own simple track, my, uh, my aunt was talking to me the other day, and she was saying, where, where are you headed off to now? And I said, oh, I'm going to uh, this Bioneers conference. And she said, oh, what is that about? So I did my best in my language to explain it to her. And she said, that's a really good thing. She said, how did you, get, how did you manage to do that? <laughs> and I said, I'm not really sure, but I think I, ma <laughs> I managed to do that by, by talking about some of the things that just seem everyday and simple to us, that seem to make sense to us, that seem to make complete... that seem to make uh, complete strangers, loved ones of ours, that we've brought into our community that are now part of my family and part of my extended community. People like Fritjof and people like Zenobia and other people who are friends here who are part of that. For me, inside of me, they feel the same as my aunt to me. And I think that's how we need to relate to each other. I think that's how we need to be with each other in order for us to be the way we need to be on the land. So that those things that are material that seem to overwhelm us in their demand um, in terms of saying, I'm your security, I'm your security blanket, you know, you need a new car, you need lots of money, you need to do this and do that in terms of the power, that starts to dissipate when we understand that the power is us that we are our security on the land, and that that's what's going to sustain us. The last thing that I wanted to um, share with you is that uh, one of the things that 
made a lot of sense to me was uh, my father's words. The words that he used were um, the ins word for insanity, which for us has a meaning that says that too many people are talking about different things rather than people talking about the same thing. And one of the things that I looked at in regards to that is that there does seem to be an insanity because of what's missing inside of us in terms of our humanity with each other. And that when we start to take care of that, that the land has an effect on us in, in that sense. One of the things that I learned is that when we take our young people out to the land in the work that we do to gather seeds or to, to gather the indigenous foods, and we, we started a program to replant hab, habitat of indigenous foods for some of the endangered species. We've got about 10,000 plants going now to replant in indigenous plants, uh, both for ourselves and sustainment and for the endangered species. But what we find is that when we take the people out, uh, we, we have all kinds of community members coming out uh, from the non-native community, from the multicultural societies, from the senior people's communities, and they just love going out there to gather the seeds and pot them and, and replant habitat. And one of the things that we found is that our young people, um, the young people who are having such a difficult time, all young people are having such a difficult time that it heals them, that the process of being with people out there on the land, it's, it's not just the work of collecting the seeds, and people who are in farming know this, um, that it's not just the work of collecting, but it's being with people, that community and communing with each other, and how the land communes its, its spirit to you heals people in an incredibly profound way. We need to think about how we can do more of that, and I'm, I deeply respect Fritjof Capra's work in the Center for Eco Lit Literacy and the work that they're involved in. And uh, we've been connected to that in some ways in the, last, in the last 10 years, and I've tried to contribute some of my thinking in that area and bring some of that back home to our community. So I wanted to thank you for listening to me, and I hope my words uh, can be a contribution in some way to all of the good works and all of the good thinking that you're all about. And I love you all. Thank you.